Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Joker Rogers here in Lagos. Head of the Ukrainian military says Russia fired 81 missiles of various types overnight as it launched a fresh deadly onslaught against Ukraine. Villagers in the western Lviv region carried a body bag from over the rubble from a brick house completely destroyed by the strike. The new wave of strikes killed at least six people and knocked out power, including the Russian-controlled nuclear power station. Regional authorities say five people were killed in the Zolokiv district after a rocket fell on houses. And in Ukraine's capital, Kyiv, residents were awakened by explosions in the early hours of today. The seven-hour airstrike, which lasted through the night, is reported to be the longest of the five-month Russian air campaign. Video showed several burnt cars in the yard of a high-rise residential block where police officers and first aid crews were gathered. Kyiv mayor Vitaly Klitschko reported explosions in the southwestern part of the capital. Meanwhile, three civilians were reported killed by artillery in Ukraine's southern city of Kherson. Kherson's regional state administration posted a video showing damaged public transport facilities. Local authorities said two people died at the bus stop and another woman from an ammunition shrapnel that hit a nearby shop. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said critical infrastructure and residential buildings had been hit in 10 regions. The viewer is Anna Chernikova joins me now from Kiev. Anna, great to see you again today. Uh, what a day it's been across Ukraine. I hope you're safe where you are in Kiev. Uh, give us an update. Uh, good evening. Yeah, it was quite a tough day, quite a tough night. Um, I personally woke up at uh, 5.50 in the morning in Kiev um, uh, to a sound of explosion, uh, one of the explosions that... Uh, that uh, all Kyiv citizens heard uh, today. Um, uh, as you correctly said, 81 missile uh, was fired today by Russian forces across the country. Uh, in, and also additionally um, to this, eight drones. Um, the air alarm started yesterday late in the evening and it was on until uh, around seven o'clock in the morning. So basically the whole night. Uh, I should say that it was one of the longest air alerts um, of what I remember since February last uh, last year, uh, and it was definitely one of the biggest, uh, one of the most massive attacks, um, uh, definitely, uh, and particularly in the past uh, in the past months, because um, it was it was quite um, quite a huge one. Uh, Ukrainian authorities confirmed that it was quite a special attack because Russian forces used six different type of missiles this time. And this includes a hypersonic aeroballistic Kinjal missile. And a Kinjal missile uh, is uh, a missile that Russian forces do not use often. Uh, and it's something that Ukrainian air defense cannot destroy. Uh, it's something that is used for uh, like 100% results uh, for a success hit. And uh, the sound of this missile was exactly what I personally woke up to. Uh, it was very powerful and it hit energy infrastructure, energy facility in, in the capital. Uh, this time, you, Russian forces used six uh, missiles of this kind. And according to Ukrainian uh, Air Force, uh, this is uh, the biggest amount since the beginning of full-scale invasion that Russian forces have used at once. Uh, and other types of missiles included uh, caliber as, as usually, but also some types of missiles that also air defense of Ukraine cannot destroy. So what we know for the moment, uh, this was confirmed by the Ukrainian general staff that 34 missiles were destroyed by air defense and four drones were destroyed. So. I mean, we can see that a lot of missiles actually uh, were uh, either, he, uh, either hit the target uh, um, or uh, like didn't hit the target, but hit uh, certain areas because they were just not, uh, Ukrainian air defense did not destroy them either 
because it just didn't have this possibility or because it was too much of them at once. Uh, anyway, uh, we know for the moment that in general at least six people were killed, five of them uh, in the city, uh, in, in the Lviv region. Uh, in, it, it was an, a very unfortunate hit of the residential area in the Lviv region. Uh, and um, uh, also three people at least were injured in the city of Kyiv. Uh, the footage that we've just seen um, of the residential building and destroyed cars, this is exactly where those people uh, were injured. Um, for the moment, again, uh, we know that the main target was energy infrastructure. And for instance, in the city of Zaporizhia, one of the energy facilities were he, was uh, hit, uh, hit five times, so five missiles in the same place. Uh, the city of Kharkiv and Kharkiv region in, in total uh, had at least 15 hits. Uh, as I already mentioned, the city of Kyiv had one hit of the energy infrastructure as well, uh, and also uh, there are damages uh, of the energy infrastructure in, de in almost every uh, region of the country, particularly in the north, west, south, and central parts of the country. Uh, but, and of course, uh, and of course, eastern part of the country was also under uh, a heavy attack, uh, particularly the city of Kharkiv and Kharkiv region. Uh, today, uh, also what was reported by Ukr Energo, the Ukrainian major energy company, that Due to today's attack, uh, the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, uh, the, the power of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant was disrupted. And, uh, uh, but uh, two hours ago, uh, Ukrainian uh, Ukrainergo confirmed that uh, the power was established back, so the, uh, the power plant uh, was back to Ukrainian energy system, at least the, one of the lines that uh, supports the, the operation of the nuclear power plant, because it was, of course, it was a very dangerous situation once again. Uh, as we understand, a nuclear power plant, if there is a trouble with, with, uh, with this energy supply, it could cause a very bad uh, nuclear accident. So uh, it was uh, quite a big risk today, uh, but fortunately for the moment, uh, at least at least at this point of time, uh, uh, the power, power plant is back, um, uh, is back to the Ukrainian uh, energy system. Uh, and uh, what else I can add that um, definitely energy facility and uh, this was the main target and in different parts of the country, uh, there were this attack caused troubles with electricity, water and heating uh, supply for the citizens. Uh, but according to Ukrainian authorities, most of the regions uh, have the critical infrastructure supply back in order as of now. Right, uh, but po possibly uh, that's most, but not all. So how are the people coping, or how have they been coping without uh, electricity and other, uh, you know, energy facilities, which is very important for day-to-day -day living? Well, uh, it was definitely something that Ukrainians have already been through for months now, uh, a couple of months now. and. Uh, um, uh, this was not a long term this time, so uh, it was a certain problem right after the attack. Attack uh, finished at around 7 o'clock in the morning, so by 10, 11 o'clock in the morning, most of the uh, most of the areas uh, were had had all the supplies back, not completely, of course. Uh, but uh, also during the attack, uh, it was already uh, the outages were already in order in, uh, because uh, energy companies wanted to prevent some uh, serious technical issues uh, that the attack could cause. Um, so um, this outages, pre preventive outages, let's put it this way, they actually helped, uh, again, according to the energy officials, they helped to reduce the time of uh, uh, of this repair works and of this uh, outages caused uh, afterwards by the attack. Uh, but of course people, well, I should say that Ukrainians, well, are kind of went through this situation already, even through wars, because a couple of months ago, if we, uh, if we look back, um, the situation was much worse. So uh, today, uh, it, it's, it was not 
uh, that definitely was not was not easy hours for for Ukrainians, but uh, but fortunately for the moment, uh, most of the areas and most of the regions um, have uh, all the supplies, most of the supplies back. Uh, and public transport uh, is also back in order. However, um, some uh, public transport facilities, such as electric, especially electric public transport facilities, they have some uh, changes in their schedules. Anna, word is that you know this is the you know biggest uh, missile strike since uh, mid-February, ending the you know longest lull period of comparative calm uh, since Moscow began this campaign. Are there fears that there will be more sustained attacks now that that, you know, calm has been broken? Uh, well, I should say that Ukrainians were expecting this attack, of, but it was expected earlier. So uh, everyone expected here in Ukraine, everyone expected it for the anniversary for the 24th of February or 23rd of February. So uh, it was kind of uh, something that, um, well, I should say society did not doubt that uh, the attack should happen. But um, uh, when it didn't happen, uh, Ukrainian officials uh, were uh, publicly saying that uh, Ukrainians should get ready for for attack, uh, for possible attack to happen still. So the risks were still high. Uh, and I should not, I should say that it was not, you know, a complete surprise. Of course, the, uh, you know, the, uh, well, the level of this attack, the, the, um, such a massive attack uh, is something that uh, definitely, you know, no one can prepare uh, completely for that uh, and the scale of this attack. But uh, it's not the first time uh, again. And uh, as I already said, Ukrainians expected that something should happen. And considering that it was quite a long period of time since the previous attack, uh, the, it was quite a high risk that uh, this one uh, would be very massive. So Moscow says, you know, its campaign targeting critical infrastructures just to ensure that, you know, Ukrainian troops or Ukraine itself cannot fight back. So how are the troops in Ukraine holding down, you know, their positions in repelling attacks from Russia? Uh, well, I should say that uh, particularly targeting energy infrastructure, uh, well, it's something that's causing probably more troubles for civilians, for civilian life. Um, of course, it uh, also, well, has its, you know, has its effect on all, absolutely all uh, areas of, 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 of life in Ukraine, including military. But um, I should also say that uh, frontline battles, uh, it's something that do not, you know, directly um, affected by this particular attack. So frontline battles, uh, well, continue uh, very intensively, especially in the east. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, such attacks cause uh, more difficulties. Uh, but again, mostly for the civilians, at, at least in this particular case that uh, we see today, for example. Uh, so, um, uh, I, of course, I'm not a military expert, but again, according to U Ukrainian military officials, uh, um, they point out that uh, mostly uh, this is civilian, well, critical infrastructure, civilian targets, unfortunately. And uh, mm, while well, Ukrainian forces continue to, to, to do their task as a frontline uh, operational tasks and de defending tasks. So uh, we do not have any information that uh, this particular attack uh, caused certain, uh, you know, changes in the operational, uh, uh, in the operational actions of the Ukrainian army. So at least, at least this is not what uh, is confirmed and reported by the official sources. All right, I must get uh, one more thing out of you before I do let you go. Uh, it's, it's about possible normalcy of life, well, as normal as it can get. Yesterday we spoke to a student uh, from here in Nigeria that has returned to Ukraine, went through Poland, that is, and said school is back on. Not many students, but they are getting through school. Uh, 
you know, on-site training uh, and schooling. Um, how normal, you know, is uh, school life for, you know, universities or for uh, students in the primary and secondary schools? Uh, are schools back on or is it online classes? What's going on with life in, you know, in the different regions? Uh, well, mostly what we see across the country is that uh, schools, kindergartens, uh, universities uh, uh, continue to work, and mostly they work with mixed uh, mixed schedules. So, uh, in those areas, uh, so not frontline areas, definitely. So we're not talking about frontline uh, frontline areas, but uh, like central part of the country, west part of the country, north and south, uh, where uh, frontline is well relatively far. Um, these, all these institutions, all these educational institutions, have mixed um, uh, mixed teaching uh, schedules. So students are um, studying online and uh, offline uh, where it is possible. But offline uh, is only possible if the, the educational facility has shelter, because every time when air alarm is on students should go down to the shelter so uh, this is this is the uh, this is the must uh, the must for, for the facility to have a shelter if a facility do not have a shelter then well in this case it's online uh, education um, schedule and uh, uh, but again uh, education facilities continue to work um, if we talk about frontline uh, well a lot of facilities they just work uh, online in the online regime uh, or they are you know relocated in in safer areas but uh, well th this is probably this is probably what what's happening right now right Anna, thank you so much and uh, please do stay safe yourself thank you Let's move on. Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency, Rafael Grossi, says the Russian-held Zaporizhia nuclear power plant in Ukraine has lost all external power supply. He says it's relying on diesel generators a lot as a last line of defense to prevent meltdown from overheating reactor fuel. Zaporizhia nuclear power plant is running on emergency diesels. The last, the last line of defense. This is the sixth time. Let me say it again. This is the sixth time that the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant has lost all of site power and has had to operate in this emergency mode. Let me remind you, this is the largest nuclear power station in Europe, operating for the sixth time under emergency diesel generators. What are we doing? The How European Union foreign policy chief Josep Borrell says he had suggested the bloc spend 1 billion euros for the joint procurement of ammunition for Ukraine and to refill their own stockpiles. Officials warned that Ukraine is burning through shells faster than its allies can make them, prompting a renewed search for ammunition and ways to ramp up production. A massive joint munitions buying effort will be a landmark step for the EU as defense procurement has largely been in the hands of the bloc's individual member governments. We need a new support package through the European Peace Facility. We need a new support package for the reimbursement of the immediate delivery of ammunition that has to come from the national stocks already existing or pending orders, work in process, any type, NATO standard or Soviet standard, 155 millimeters or 152 millimeters. And for this support package, I propose to the ministers 1 billion euros from the European Peace Facility. If we go together, we can reduce not only unit prices, but also we can reduce the delivery time. And the European Peace Facility 
can support these efforts for the benefit of Ukraine, and I propose to mobilize another billion euros for this second track. I think I can say that it has been a general agreement on this procedure, but there are questions pending. Everything has to be discussed in detail. Everyone agreed on the urgency to move because everybody agrees on the objective, which is to support Ukraine as much as possible and as quickly as possible. But we are talking about, by the time being, speculations, investigations on the exact circumstances are still ongoing in Sweden. Maybe you can say something about it, dear minister, on Denmark and in Germany. And let's be serious, as long as investigations are ongoing, we cannot draft, draw definitive conclusion. What can I say? I have to wait for having a clear understanding of what has happening. In the meantime, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has confirmed consistent implementation of commitments under OPEC+. Plus. He made the announcement during a press conference with his Saudi counterpart, Prince Faisal bin Farhan al Saud. Mr. Lavrov says all the countries participating in this format are consistently implementing their commitments aimed at ensuring the due balance and stability on the global energy market. Saudi Arabia is coordinating closely with Russia on energy markets and is committed to the OPEC plus agreement between the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries and its allies. And the leaders of U.S. intelligence agencies say China is deepening its cooperation with Russia to try to challenge the United States despite international condemnation of the invasion of Ukraine. It comes as the agency identified the Beijing government as the principal threat to the U.S. around the world. The hearing coincided with the release of the intelligence agency's annual global threat assessment. But are otherwise needless to say the People's Republic of China, which is increasingly challenging the United States economically, technologically, politically and militarily around the world, remains our unparalleled priority. Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, under President Xi Jinping, will continue efforts to achieve Xi's vision of making China the preeminent power in East Asia and a major power on the world stage. To fulfill Xi's vision, however, the CCP is increasingly convinced that it can only do so at the expense of U.S. power and influence, and by using coordinated whole-of-government tools to demonstrate strength and compel neighbors to acquiesce to its preferences, including its land, sea, and air claims in the region and its assertions of sovereignty over Taiwan. In brief, the CCP represents both the leading and most consequential threat to U.S. national security and leadership globally, and its intelligence-specific ambitions and capabilities make it for us our most serious and consequential intelligence rival. During the past year, the threat has been additionally complicated by a deepening collaboration with Russia, which also remains an area, obviously, of intense focus for the intelligence community. And Latvia began seizing cars from heavily drunk drivers this year. And as hundreds of vehicles began filling up impound lots, the country decided to send them to the Ukrainian military and hospitals. Seven cars were driven in a snowstorm onto a trailer and out of a state impound lot destined for Ukraine. 200 cars were taken from drivers found with blood alcohol levels over 0.15% in two months in the Baltic nation of 1.9 million people. It actually is very scary when I realized this uh, amount of cars driving around with drunk drivers. So I said that it's like we have actually so many kamikaze drones, but luckily not exploding. Actually, no one expected that there would be so many of those cars. People are driving, uh, drunk driving, so 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 many of them, and and it was a bit of uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, 
they just can can can't sell them uh, as as many as people are are drinking. <laughs> so that's why came the idea. So okay, maybe send them to Ukraine. Authority somehow handling them to how to say uh, as to uh, deliver back to market by auctions and we decided why we should do so if we can help to oh really national hero Renis Posnyaks who is really de already delivered 1000 cars to the front line uh, we said why you can take those cars and he says oh that's very good and right now is uh, tax authority cooperated with Twitter Konyas, uh, convoys and they choosing the right uh, proper cars and first delivery of Already happen. I'm very happy about it. Uh, of course, we can't build any plants on uh, drunk drivers. Uh, and of course, the law in place. If there will be more cars, we will uh, we will give them uh, to Ukrainian uh, friends.